here on in in this class that has not thus far been a factor, or at least not uh, a major factor, is the issue of browser compatibility. Okay? What do I mean by browser compatibility? I mean that you may design a web page and you may look at it in one web browser, such as Google Chrome, which is a typical one that I use, and it might not look the same in another browser. All right? Why do you think that is? Why do you think it looks different in different browsers? I'm following the rules of HTML, right? Well, the browser themselves is going to find different companies. They're, they're treating each one of these pages. Okay, but shouldn't they all be following the same rules? HTML is a standard, right? That's a possibility, but, but that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. The, the answer was that there could be some default settings that are different. That's true. All right. For example, the font might look different uh, on one browser or another if the default settings are different. But I'm talking about bigger issues. In other words, my, what my question is, is you know, we're following the rules of HTML. There's a standard for HTML. There's a set of rules. If you go to w3c.org, all right, You'll see defined in, in brutally precise language to the point where it's, it's pretty tough to understand how these tags are supposed to work. All right? So the fact that there's different programs reading them, um, if they're all following the same standard, you know, why, why do some pages look different on one browser versus another? There's a real simple answer. It has nothing to do with... Standard ought to be, the standard is worded pretty precisely, and there really shouldn't be any judgment calls there. Not to say that there aren't. No, I'm trying to parse this thing. Go ahead. I mean, it's much simpler than that. There, there's two things. You know, there's the, uh, you know, th this largely comes down to a, a, uh, a theoretical versus a, uh, in practice difference. In theory, yes, there's an HTML standard, and every browser maker is going to follow that HTML standard perfectly and therefore your pages will look the same on every browser. All right. That's the theory. In practice, however, a couple things happen. First thing is, is people that write browsers are just that. They're people. They make mistakes. So there could be a misinterpretation of the specification. So that's a possibility. Um, it shouldn't really be a judgment call. It should be more of a misinterpretation, I guess I would, I would call it. Um, or they tried to get it right, but they got it wrong. You know why? Uh, you know why? You know was there? You know why did someone drop a ball in a football game? You know well, they, I'm sure he tried to catch it. He just fell short, and it's sort of the same thing with browsers. Browser makers are people, humans, just like us, which means that they may try to implement the specification, but they may get it wrong some way. And if you consider all the different way, even with the, you know, we haven't even covered all the tags yet, but just with the, with the subset of tags that we've covered, all right, um, all the different combinations you put things together and all the different CSS that you could have, there's a lot of combinations. So it's, it's difficult, and in fact, it's impossible to test every combination that someone might throw at a browser of tags and CSS rules and so on, all right? So try as they may, they're not perfect. They're not going to get everything right. The second issue is it's sort of a moving target. In other words, it's not as though the W3C releases the specification. It says, here you go. Take a year, develop a browser, and then everyone publish it. The specification is in a state of revision until it's adopted. And things are added, things are taken away. And typically what happens is Instead of people developing a browser after the specification is finalized and approved, people try to implement pieces of it as time goes on. Therefore, browsers um, may do part of HTML5, but not all of it. All right? They may have implemented some of the common features, but neglected some common features, or, or some uncommon features even. So the fact that all these things are happening at the same time means that there's no clear finish point where you say, okay, 
Now let's go and start implementing uh, the browser changes, all right, and, and develop a, a web browser for a particular specification. Another issue, too, is you never know what the person on the other end has as far as browser goes, all right? They may be someone that has an older version of a browser before the HTML5 spec was even dreamed up, all right, or was very incomplete, and not much might be implemented in it. So as a result, you don't know. Someone could be running an old browser. You don't want to get into the business of telling people, gee, you have to update your browser to view this. I don't think that's a good approach. Uh, I've seen sites that say that, and it might be OK to suggest that, but I don't think it's a good idea to require that. So all these factors, the bottom line, means that your page might look different on one browser versus another. What do you do about that? Well, you have two choices, all right? I guess these are the two choices you have when faced with any problem, all right? You could do something or you could do nothing, <laughs> all right? Seems pretty easy. Um, it really depends on the situation. Depending how the page looks, you might need to do something because it might be a mess in some browser, in which case you have to do something, otherwise your page will be un unworkable or unreadable in a particular browser. Or if the page still looks reasonably good, even though it's not exactly the way you'd want it to be, you might say, well, that's good enough. I'm not going to worry about it. Let's take as an example, a concrete example of this, and we'll, we'll explain why it, it looks this way. The example that we were working on last time, the, the two skiing web pages that we had. Here we have <coughs> this page developed in Chrome. It's a pretty new version of Chrome, and Chrome typically has very good HTML5 support. So the stuff that I put in there, that's how I wanted it to look. All right? Let's compare that to the same page viewed in a version of Internet Explorer prior to IE9. Prior to IE9, there was big issues with HTML5 implementation. So let's view the same page view uh, in um, Internet Explorer. And we'll notice that it is different. The main difference being that this is quite a bit bigger margin over here than over here. All right. Now, our choices, <coughs> what do we do? <coughs> Excuse me. Something or nothing. Well, we look at this and we say, how bad do we think it is? All right. I would look at this and argue and say, it's legible still. You can read it. It might not be exactly what I intended. So depending on how much time I had, how much resources I had, how sure I was that I could fix it, I may either say, yeah, I'm going to take a shot at fixing it, or no, I'm not going to uh, take a shot at fixing it. All right? So you have to make the judgment call. There will be other cases that will look ugly, that it, there, there's no doubt that you have to do something about it. This one, I guess I would say, is a judgment call. Now. This is IE version. I have no idea where to see the version. Under help. Thanks. Yeah, there we go. About Internet Explorer. This is IE 7, so this is really old. All right. Um, if we look. Oops. There's a number of good sites that shows you how well a particular browser uses HTML5. So I just typed in HTML5 compatibility. There's one in particular I'm looking for. Oh, this is a link 
to all of these. Let's look at can I use. Oh, okay. Let's look at some HTML5 elements. One of them is the look at all HTML5 features. All right, here we go. Here's a list of specific features. New semantic elements. All right, that's the one I was looking for. This is header, aside, article, the ones that we're talking about. Now, what this is telling us is that these will work in pretty much anything but IE 7 and 8 and anything prior to that. So we know just in advance that, gee, um, you know, if, if we use these elements, we will run into potential issues on IE prior to that. So this chart is a nice little feature to, to, to help us identify what we need to test. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't use any of these HTML5 elements? No, that's not a good idea. All right. Um, there's a number of fixes and little catches, sometimes they're called hacks that we can do to fix these issues. And well, let's look at one that they talk about in the book. It's called the HTML5 shiv. And what you do is it's a little file that you can download. And we can take this and we can copy it into one of, our, one of our folders. Let's just put it in our main folder. And then we can copy this code and paste it in our page. For our purposes, it doesn't really matter if you know how this works or not. It's kind of like gravity, right? Gravity works whether you understand how it works or not. But as a, in essence, this is a little snippet of JavaScript that looks to see if you're in a version of IE that is less than version 9 of IE. If you, are, if you are in a version less than IE 9, it runs a little JavaScript. Now, we haven't talked about JavaScript yet in this class, but JavaScript is, is sort of a third component to web pages beyond HTML and CSS. So, if we're in IE less than 9, we're going to run this script, and that will fix it so that it will recognize some of those HTML5 tags. It's not going to make it fully HTML5 compatible, but it will allow it to recognize the header and the article and the aside and so on. So let me go and paste this in both of my pages. <clears throat> because it's not CSS code. Yeah, it's JavaScript code, so it needs to be, <clears throat> excuse me, within the HTML um, file. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow. So we'll put that there and save it. And now, should have no impact at all if I view this page in Google Chrome. You know, I'd be a shame if it broke it in Google Chrome, right, to fix it in IE. All right. But it doesn't have any effect right because that code is ignored for Google Chrome but if we view this page now in Internet Explorer lo and behold it warns us about this because it, it thinks that maybe we have picked up a virus or something this little code a user on the web wouldn't get that warning message 
And there we go. And now it looks the same as it did in Chrome. This is described in the book, and, and you can, if you Google HTML5 shiv, you can do what I did, and I can help you out if you have any issues with it. But the bigger issue is this, that especially now that we're using HTML5 elements and using CSS, browser compatibility will be an issue. It's suggested that you don't wait until you're done with your site or your page and then test it across browsers. All right. Back in the old days when I worked developing web pages full time, you'd hear people at the time it was, and this will, this will date this particular work, but still, at the time it was Netscape or IE. All right. And it was funny because you'd have some people say, I hate Netscape because all the pages I develop look great in IE, but then when I go and look at them in Netscape, they look horrible. Then you'd have some other people that say, I hate IE because I develop all my pages in Netscape and they look great and it looks horrible. All right. The problem is, is you're going to like whatever browser that you've been developing in all along if you make your page look good only in that browser. So therefore, and, and I'll try to make a point of doing this throughout class, it's best to test it in multiple browsers throughout the process. Because if you get to the end, you may have a half dozen different compatibility issues that you have to address. If you incrementally test it, like as you go forward, do a, a little bit of coding, test it in a couple different browsers, then if there's any issues, you can immediately address them and, and catch them, as opposed to waiting to the end and have a whole slew of issues. Yes? Is there a shift for the other there's really not one that's needed. There actually is a Firefox CSS file that we can put in. Let me pop that one in too. Now I don't think we have Firefox uh, uploaded on or, or uh, installed on this machine, so I can't um, test it. But I'm using it in one of my other classes. So, Oh, you would. Okay. Yeah. We just, we, you know, this is just, this is just the first opportunity I've had to talk about these. Yeah. Actually, if you're going to do a good job, you would try to test on multiple versions of those even. All right. Yeah. Because, uh, again, IE9 behaves a lot different than IE8, which behaves different than IE7 and so on. So. Uh, the, the real answer is as many as you can, all right, as many as you can. Um, there are services that you can, you can pay for that you put your website out there and it essentially runs it through these different browsers and takes a snapshot of it and that, that's sort of a nice thing, but, but those cost, all right. Um, definitely you want to hit, um, you know, Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, you probably want to hit the mobile browsers as well. All right, we haven't talked about mobile yet, but you would want to hit those as well. So Android, iOS. Um, typically, you can guess based on usage statistics which browsers are important to you and, and which ones that you need to test. Certainly, if I found something wrong with my page and the problem only showed up on IE5, let's say, I might be a little, I might be more, a little more willing to say, ah, we'll just let that one slide, especially if it's not a huge deal. If, however, with the latest version of IE or let's say IE9 or IE8, I saw a problem, I'd be more inclined to fix it. So. Again, that's a great question, and, and no one has, uh, you, you know, again, this is a theoretical versus practical uh, concern. Uh, in theory, which browser would you test? As many as you can. In practice, which ones would you test? Well, the ones that you suspect will get heavy usage. Now, if you're developing a general site, you can go online and you can get some statistics about browser usage, but those statistics usually aren't, you got to take them with a grain of salt. Yeah, you've got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, if you 
uh, have a website that's already up and running, your particular audience may tend to have one kind of browser or another. For example, if you were developing a website for other web developers and other graphic designers, your statistics would probably be skewed in favor of, say, Chrome or Firefox, and you'd less use Internet Explorer, I would say. So you can sort of, if you already have a website, sort of get a sense of who's using what that's hitting your site. All right? Or if you have a site that really the general public is hitting, you can, you can get a sense from just general browser statistics. At any rate, the question was, what, uh, are there any little catches for, for other browsers? And here's a catch for Firefox, which we'll go and we'll put in here. We won't be able to notice the effect of this, but it, the effect would be very similar to um, the effect of the uh, hack that we put in for IE. In other words, if we had an earlier version of Firefox, the page would look like it looked in IE before the fix. Now that we've added that little fix in there, um, it would look the same as it did in Chrome. So the point is, is test across browsers and test across browsers throughout the process. All right? Your best bet for getting web pages that are consistent across browser is by following the rules. You know, not leaving any unclosed tags, for example, having proper nesting and all that. However, unfortunately, that doesn't guarantee that your site will render correctly across all the browsers, and therefore you need to test. All right? As far as mobile devices go, um, there is a Opera mobile emulator. I'm not sure if I've shown this class or not, where you can go in and you can emulate how a page, how your page is going to look like on different devices. See how this page is going to look like on uh, HTC Hero. Not really that great, but not horrible, all right? Um, to find out how you can do a better job than not great, or not horrible, but not great, um, you can tune in later on in this course, and we'll cover a brief overview of it. Or you can take CISS 268, which is mobile web development. I feel sometimes in these classes like I'm a movie maker, right? Every just like nowadays, you don't make a movie unless you put a hook in a, into it for a sequel, right? You know, they make Iron Man 1, and, and, and you know that they're already thinking of what Iron Man 2 is going to be, and sometimes they'll put little, little things in there. Well, these classes are sort of the same way. You know, we take you to a certain point in this class, but like to learn more issues related to mobile design, there's a mobile uh, web, web development course, which is CISS 268, which is a new course. It was just offered in fall for the very first time. We actually have a degree program in mobile, mobile software development where we do mobile web development and when we do Android development and iPhone development as well. So those are, those are good courses because that's definitely, you know, how do I want to say it? That avalanche has already started, <laughs> you know. You, you, don't, you don't turn back a waterfall or, or an avalanche, right? The momentum is moving in the direction of, of you know, people doing more and more stuff via the mobile devices as opposed to a desktop computer. All right, and that is not going to be reversing anytime soon or ever. All right, what I'd like to focus on, again, is some more stuff with CSS. <coughs> All right, and, and I'm going to try to practice what I preach, and as I do it in one browser, test it on the other. All right. Um, Let's look at our CSS file here that we made an external file. And again, that has the advantage that we can point to that file from
from both of our HTML uh, files. So as many HTML files as we have, we can, we can point to it. So far we've looked at a couple different selectors. Remember, as far as CSS goes, there's two pieces to a CSS rule. There's a selector, and then there is the rules itself. All right. The rules itself are in these little curly, black, curly brackets or braces, and they consist of a name of an attribute, a colon, and then a value for the attribute. Name of an attribute, colon, value of an attribute. All right. The selector says what gets the rule. The rule says, okay, what is it I'm going to change about those things? So far we have seen two, or at least in this example, we've seen two different things to do. We've seen um, HTML tags as a selector, which means that every HTML tag that matches this gets that rule. We've also seen IDs. All right. In the CSS file, the ID starts with a pound sign. And it doesn't correspond to a particular HTML tag. It corresponds to the element on the page that has some specific ID. Let's look in this case. I gave this article an ID of fears. All right. And then I specified a CSS rule for fears because there's a pound sign in front of it that indicates that it's not for some HTML tag called fears. It's for the thing that has an ID of fears gets this rule. So what's going to get this rule? The article that has an ID of fears. So if we look at page two, you'll notice that this article, and only this article, has um, a background of yellow. An ID ought to be unique. I think I've mentioned that before. That is, within a given page, there should only be one thing that has that ID. All right. That's different than a class. All right. A class, there can be multiple instances of it within a page. If you think about students, how many students share your ID, share your ID number? None should. You should be the only person with a given ID number. But if I was talking about, you know, first year students, second year students, uh, oh, Lorain County resident students, out of county residents, those are classes of students. How many can be in each of those classes? Well, there can be a lot of them, right? So a class is something that can be shared between elements on the page, where an ID ought to be distinct. So, carrying in line of our, of our um, um, discussion of, of skiing here, let me make a uh, class for equipment, all right? And for some reason, you know, presumably I'm an equipment salesman here. I have a sporting goods store or something. That's why I have this web page. So I want the, the parts about the equipment to really stand out, all right? Those are, those are different than the rest of the paragraphs. So I may have some paragraphs. Let's go to our home page. I may have some paragraphs here that go on and talk about the history of skiing and proper skiing technique. But maybe interspersed throughout here, I have some um, article, or not some articles, but some paragraphs about equipment. And I want those to stand out. All right? Again, fundamental rule of design is that things that mean the same or have the same significance ought to look the same. All right? So let's say I have, let me go in this HTML page. And let me put in 
a paragraph that talks about equipment. If you ski, you are going to need boots. All right. Maybe somewhere else I'm talking about the skis. There are a variety of skis you can purchase. So I'm just going in here and I'm just putting a few paragraphs in. There could be, there could be anywhere in there. But the idea is what binds all these together is that I'm all talking about equipment. And because I'm a sporting equipment store, all right, in this example, I want those to stand out a little bit somehow. So I can make it stand out any number of different ways, all right? I'm going to do something that we haven't done before just because one of the things I want to do as well is show some different attributes, and I'm going to put a border around the things that are about equipment. That will make them stand out, all right? So, I'm going to assign a class to these that say equipment. And I'll put it around those two paragraphs that are discussing equipment. So I'll go and save this. I'll then go in my CSS file and remember equipment isn't an HTML tag, right? Equipment's not an ID because I can have more than one thing on the page that's about equipment. Equipment is a class and the way you designate a class is with a period. So when you see period equipment, that means that anything on the page that has a class of equipment is going to get this style rule. All right? So, what can we make the style rule say? We can make it say something like border two pixel black solid. All right? We'll talk about what all that means. It's pretty obvious. I think that border is the two pixel indicates how wide the border is. Black indicates the color of the border. And solid indicates the type of border it is. In other words, it's, it's uh, a solid line as opposed to any of the other possibilities like a dotted line, a dashed line. There's a whole bunch of other possibilities. Again, I don't make these up. These are part of the, the, the CSS rule, right? I can define a border and Solid is one of the valid choices for border. All right, so let me go and save this. Let me go and save this and bring it up. And you'll notice those two paragraphs that I said are about equipment um, are highlighted on the basis of them having a border. So we make them stand out. So I can go and do this, you know, anywhere on my page, you know, or on any page. If there is something on my second page that deals with equipment, I can put a paragraph, or really anything. I could put a heading if I wanted to, or, or any, any HTML tag. I can say this is, I'm sorry, that's not ID, that should be class. Class equals equipment. There are two kinds of cross country skis classic and skating. And now we notice that, again, our second page, I have that in the, the fear article. So let me move that after the fear article because I don't want it to be yellow. All right, there we go. All 
I'll put it in another article. To get a more consistent look on this. All right, there we go. So now we have three things on our page that we can use, all right, to select things that get a style. One of the things is HTML tag. So if we say an HTML tag, that means every one of those HTML tags will look a certain way. Now, in many cases, that may be exactly what we want. Right? We want all our top level headings to look the same. Right? Why? Because they mean the same. All right? But if there is one or maybe a couple different elements on the page that are slightly different, like we designated the one paragraph is talking about my fear of skiing downhill, and the other paragraphs are talking about equipment, we can either assign an ID if it's unique or we can assign a class if there's potentially multiple instances of it. Now, here's the interesting thing. We can mix and match stuff. All right. So, for example, I could say that I could say, all right, these are both H2s. So if I give a style for the H2, which I've done, all my H2s are going to look that way. There we go. That's an H2, that's an H2. Because I am my selector for H2, both of them look the same. What I can do, though, is I could say something like, if it's an H2 and it's within an article, make it look different. So how do I do that? I could say article H2. made that one green. All right. So we can mix and match all different kinds of ways. When you get to it, I mean, it's really, you know, it's one of those things like they describe about chess, right? Chess, there's only a handful of rules, right? Yet, you know, just because you've memorized those rules doesn't mean that, that, that you're a good chess player. Same, same idea here. There's so many combinations of how you can do things and style things, all right? Um, that's where a little bit of pre-planning goes a, a long way in, in thinking about it, all right? But now we can design pages that even the same tag can look different based on the section it is, it's in. The classic example of that is what we might want to do with a navigation section. We might want to have the links in our navigation section look differently than the links in the body of an article, all right? So if I have a navigation bar with, with links to my home page and this page and this page, I might want to style them so that they're very big, so that they're very prominent, so everyone can see what my navigation is. If in the middle of an article, though, I have a link that says, for more information, click here, all right, that I might just want to look like a regular old link. I might want to not have it any sort of special styling and just have it the same size as everything, the same color or whatever, all right? So... By carefully thinking through this, you can define what selectors you want to see. Now, 
We'll go over a lot of different permutations of this and some additional things with this and so on, but this sort of sets the foundation. And this sort of gives an idea of the flexibility you have of how to point to something on the page. So now you can point to something based on the tag, the tag within a tag, an ID, a class, or even a class within a tag. All right. If I have a paragraph that is about equipment, I might want to make it look then a link that's about equipment. All right. So I can really fine tune it to select any particular element on the page that I want and style it. Yes. It should apply to any HTML element. Yes. So, for example, if we want to put a border around this image, it depends. I would ask myself, first of all, do I want every image to look like this? All right. If I do, then I just use a plain old image tag or the image rule for, the, for that. If I wanted all images that were of a similar kind, maybe I have, um, you know, pictures of someone de demonstrating the proper ski technique, and I want all of those pictures to stand out a little bit, then maybe I would use an ID. If I literally just want one image to look that way, like maybe our logo, I want to have a border but nothing else, then I'd use an ID. Additionally, I could always look and say, well, maybe the rest of the images I want to look some way, but if there's an image inside an article, I want it to look another way. So you have a lot of flexibility on how to go. All right? You know, you'll never get a straight answer from me like, yeah, just, yeah, just put a class on it. Yeah. No. Because it is. I mean, seriously, it is a matter of judgment. It is a matter of why you're styling it differently. That's an important thing to remember, you know. Our rule is that like things should look the same. And we've come up with all these different exceptions to how make it look different than an HTML tag. Your focus ought to be on why you're making it look different. I'm making that paragraph look different because it's about equipment. All right. Then, when you create the class name, call the class name equipment. Don't call the class name bordered, for example. Because what if you want to show equipment a different way? Uh, and you take out the border and maybe put a different background color. All right. Or this H2. This is an H2, you know, I could do something like call, give, create a class called green. All right, but what if I choose to make it red? You know, then there's a class that says green that actually makes it red. You talk about confusing to maintain. You know, it would be, be, be very difficult. So, in essence, what I said is, hmm, every H2 inside an article, I want to look different. So therefore, I define my style rule to say every H2 within an article. Question. Let me ask you a simple question. Not going to do it code. Okay. You're, you have an assignment or a commission. Right. Okay. Okay. Before you even sit down and note that, mm -hmm. are you writing out sort of tags that you were going to be doing, classes that you were going to be doing? Where we've gone through and done this is the Democrat example, we go in and. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 
Um, the question the question came down as an excellent question, and um, I'll do my best to answer it um, as well as I can. The question came is like, let's say I had an assignment, and in this case, I, I, I in this example, I'm pretty much just saying we want to have equipment to look different. So this is what you do. All right. You might not know that, right? You might not know going into it that you want equipment to look different. All right. Um, so how would the, how would you come up with the idea that I wanted a special class for equipment and I want a special class for this or a special class for that? Um, and that's a great question. And and first of all, you're absolutely right in saying that there's a lot of planning that needs to take place. All right. You absolutely don't just jump and start hacking away without thinking about it. All right. You, you think a planet. A lot of times, what you have. Uh, and, and we'll talk about the design process to a degree, uh, you know, you know in, in some upcoming classes. But I guess the general approach I would take is, first of all, understand the goals that the organization has. So, for example, in this case, the, the hypothetical situation you're talking about is I'm running a sporting goods store. Um, it'd be pretty obvious that one of the goals that the sporting goods store would have would be to showcase their equipment and do that, you know, and, and to be able to sell it and have links to it and all that. So anything they do is going to be sort of geared on, even if it's a page that like how to ski, sort of the, 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 the subtext of that is like, here's how to ski and oh yes, if you're interested in trying this, we'll be happy to sell you poles, boots, bindings, and so on. So by understanding the goals that the organization has, and by understanding the goals that the people visiting that page are going to have, that tips you off on what ought to be important. All right. So that would give you some guidance about what you would want to emphasize. All right. So, for example, there, there's a few things that are given. You know, you want your navigation to be very clear. All right. So. It's a pretty good idea that you will, you're going to want to do some kind of special styling with the navigation, right? That's sort of a no-brainer, right? Because one of the keys to any successful website is being able to actually get to where you want to go, all right? So right off the bat, you know the navigation is that. Um, based on the particular characteristics of the, the problem that you're trying to solve in the organization, you will probably, and, and the users that are going to be visiting that page, you're going to be identifying other things that are important, and that would give you guidance to that. Now, that gives you guidance to that. Um, what really, how do I want to say this? How you really get your answers is through sort of an iterative design process. What do I mean by iterative? In other words, you don't go in and, and, and mock up a website, say, this is what I'm going to do, boom, go and do it. You, you have a dialogue with the people that you're developing the website for. And for example, if this was the case, I may take this as a prototype, not complete, but you know, maybe has some of the features that I'm planning on doing, and show it to the person that I'm working with, with the organization uh, developing the site. And they're going to look at it, and they're going to say, well, you know, I don't know, I don't really think that stands out enough. Or I, I, I don't think this does a good job of showcasing our equipment. Maybe you do something else. And they may not even know what, and they may give you very uh, qualitative feedback as opposed to specific suggestions. Because remember, it's not their job to, to, to know the ins and outs. Um, so then it's back to the drawing board. Uh, one of the things that, one skill that you need, and it's, I don't know if I call it a skill, it's, it's more of a mindset, is that you need to develop a little bit of a thick skin, especially when you're showing prototypes. A lot of times when you show a prototype to someone, your intent is not that I've done a perfect job and I want you to pat me on the back and applaud me. All right? That's not why you create prototypes. You create prototypes as a way to spark conversation. All right. In other words, you know, look at it this way. If someone were to ask me, design 
a perfect living room for yourself. You know, the sky's the limit. Imagine what, you know, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to sit there and oh, I'm not really sure. But if someone showed me three or four samples of what I could do, I could look and say, oh, you know what? I like this one, but instead of the ping pong table that's in this one, I'd rather have a pool table or so, whatever. Someone said one of the scariest things to give someone is a blank sheet of paper, right? Because they have no idea what to do and, and all that. So especially when you're talking about users, one of the things that you need to do is you need to make, you know, you need to propose potential solutions to them by developing prototypes, showing it to them, and having a dialogue with the aim, again, that you're going to be getting closer and closer to what it is that, that they want. All right? Um, so, to answer your question completely, all right, to do the best job I can answering uh, uh, the question, the thought is, number one, that you have a sense of the goals of the organization and the goals of the people visiting the site, so you have a sense of what is important to them. And that will give you some guidance as, 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 uh, as to what it is you want to emphasize. So that's sort of point one. Point two is you probably know just based on your own experience things that are important. All right? Your customer might not tell you, gee, I want the navigation to be prominent and easy and clear. But hey, you're a web developer. You know that. So based on your own experience and maybe working on similar projects uh, and, and your insight, you may know some other things or be able to envision other things. And then finally, the last step is don't pretend that you're going to nail it and get it perfect the first time. Create a prototype, almost like a, 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 what they say, a straw man that you propose up to them that they're going to tear down and they may, you know, it's important for everyone to understand that that's the purpose of it. So, you know, sometimes people will really be like, they don't want to hurt your feelings almost. And, and, and it's like, no, I created this for you to criticize, you know, in, in the hope that by, by you giving me cr uh, criticism for it, they'll get me to, to where I need to be. So having an iterative process of you going through and, and you know, doing it um, that way. That's another reason why maintainability is such a, such a big issue. So all the things that we do, like putting things in an external style sheet, you know, hey, we know that we're going to have a navigation section and a header and all that. A lot of the issue might be how we're going to emphasize how we're going to design it. Well, we could go and we could create a prototype and create two or three different alternative style sheets and show it to them. Do you, you know, I'd be like the eye doctor, which looks better, this one, this one, or this one, you know. And from that, you can again get to the answer that you want to be. Uh, because you've done a good job of, of making your site maintainable, separating the HTML code from the CSS, and you can then get some, some good feedback. So um, it's definitely not, you know, it's definitely not like there's an easy answer to that question. You know, it's more of understanding the problem, understanding what's important, and going through some sort of iterative process where you, you try to zero in on the end product as opposed to trying to nail it in the first pass. All right. A couple th more things I want to talk about. I want to talk about, not today, of course, even, even though, you know, I say, you know, I, I almost never end on time, let alone early, all right? And today I'm like five minutes over, so I definitely try to give you more than your money's worth with each lecture, all right? I should, I should have that on my card or, or something. <laughs> But the things I want to cover next time, I want to talk about that border style a little bit because that border style is a little different than some of the other styles we've seen. So we'll take a look at why it's different. There's actually three things there. There's a color, a, a size, and a style. So we'll look at that in more detail. I want to talk about picking good colors because that's an art and that's the that's, that's a characteristic that not necessarily every individual has, you know. Just look at the clothes I wear and you can come to the conclusion that that's not a skill that everyone has. But there are tools that can help you out with that, all right. And then I want to get into talking about what makes for a well-designed site, page, and so on. And this will lead us to probably next week a discussion of your project. All right, we'll see you over in lab.